I, for one, welcome our new robot operating masters. It's good and intention. We're messing things up a little bit with this episode of Good and Intentions. As a chronological survey of the American Nintendo Entertainment System library, the idea is to look at each game in the order in which they debuted in the US. Of course, the system's initial test launch in October 1985 brought with it about 15 different titles, so we've been tackling those in the order of their original Japanese release. But here we're going just a little bit out of sequence. Robot Gyro, aka Gyromite, debuted in Japan just two months before the US launch of the system in August 1985. That puts it two weeks after the debut of its sibling release, Robot Block, aka Stackup, which launched at the end of July 1985. However, we're going to look at Gyromite first because it just makes more sense. Gyromite came packed in with the NES hardware in America and was a huge part of the system's early marketing efforts. Understanding this game is essential to understanding Stackup, too. Of course, we looked at NES light gun pack in Duck Hunt after fellow light gun release Wild Gunman, since Wild Gunman shipped in Japan first. The difference, of course, was that Wild Gunman had a remarkable legacy of its own that served as valuable context for Duck Hunt. Stack Up has no legacy and is in no way remarkable, save for the fact that it shipped in only an exceedingly rare accessory pack and has become terrifyingly expensive on the aftermarket. Gyromite, on the other hand, helped make NES a hit. It's also difficult to play properly in this day and age, and as such has become the most misunderstood NES launch game. We've explored the cataclysmic state of the US console market as it existed in 1985. Television games were 100% persona non grata after the collapse of the Atari 2600 market, which imploded so violently that competing consoles like the Intellivision and ColecoVision were sucked into the wake and destroyed along with Atari. Nintendo realized, thanks in large part to the enormous success of its arcade releases, that the reluctance of American retailers to stock their localized family computer console reflected those retailers' fears of getting stuck with millions more dollars of unsold video game inventory rather than reflecting actual disinterest in video games by consumers. The company felt confident that kids would play Nintendo games, provided kids had the opportunity to actually get their hands on the games. The challenge would be in making that love connection, and retailers were the immovable object to Nintendo's irresistible force. Hence the system's test launch. Nintendo didn't abstain from rolling out the system nationwide in October 85 because they were afraid of going too big. The problem was that they literally couldn't convince retailers across the country to stock the thing. So Nintendo took a grassroots approach. They managed to convince a handful of New York City toy retailers like FAO Schwartz to set up an NES point-of-sale display with a no-risk promise. Any systems the seller failed to move could be returned for a full credit. There would be no desperate dollar bin dumps for the NES. The NES didn't sell out that holiday season, but it did well enough that other retailers in the area took notice. That opened the door for Nintendo to expand into limited markets in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and other cities throughout the following year. By the time 1986's holiday season rolled around, the NES was available across the country, assuming you could find such a hot-ticket Christmas gift commodity, of course. The system's slow release in the US wasn't the only stratagem Nintendo employed to convince retailers to stock the NES. They also took tremendous pains to obfuscate the fact that yes, this was a device for playing video games. Corporate buyers found Nintendo's initial design for the console, a sleek, futuristic, all-in-one console and computer called the Advanced Video System, to look entirely too much like one of the early 80s consoles that had been such poison in stores. Plus, the name sounded a lot like the alternate name for Atari's 2600 console, the Video Computer System. So Nintendo renamed the system to skirt around the idea of video or games. It was now the Nintendo Entertainment System, with gigantic carts that kids slid into the discrete front panel of the system rather than slamming into the top of the machine as with older consoles. It was like a VCR, with game boxes that were almost exactly the same size as VHS cassette cases. Nintendo also dug into its history as a toy maker to create for the NES the most sophisticated gadget it had ever produced. The AVS's keyboard and cassette drive were out, replaced instead by an interactive robot toy, Rob, the robot operating buddy. Rob was a fascinating piece of work. He demonstrated a brilliant example of Nintendo's skill for repurposing existing technology in new ways. Fundamentally, Rob worked on the same technology that powered the Zapper light gun, 
with a sensor capable of reading single-frame flashes of light as information. The difference between Rob games and Zapper games, however, is that Rob reversed several key concepts behind the operation of light gun titles. When players fired the Zapper to shoot a duck or whatever, the light gun would read the screen, then transmit that visual information back to the console through the controller port for the game software to interpret. Rob, on the other hand, was an entirely self-contained gadget. He operated with a set of AA batteries, and he didn't plug into the NES the way the Zapper did. When players transmitted information to Rob, that was the end of the console's interpretation of those instructions. Instead, the flashes of on-screen light would cause Rob to perform a variety of actions. Rob's eyes were in fact a lens that contained a sensor setup similar to that of the Zapper. Depending on the signal the NES sent, Rob's motors would kick into gear and cause him to perform an action. Rob's basic design was fairly simple, consisting of a base, a stem, a head, and an adjustable shelf with arms mounted. His head contained his sensor apparatus, while both the arm shelf and the base contained motors. A small red LED on Rob's head would light up when Rob saw the TV screen, giving players a clear indication that Rob was working correctly and would interact with the game. The robot's overall design bore more than a slight resemblance to Tomy's Omnibot 2000, a remote control robot toy that in turn clearly owed a tremendous debt to R2-D2, Vincent from Disney's The Black Hole, and Tweaky from the recent Buck Rogers TV series. There was a whole lot of zeitgeist happening in Rob, and Nintendo's aim was clear. Sell the NES by presenting it as the accessory for a cool robot toy. It absolutely worked. Despite Rob's derivative design, he gave the NES a face that had nothing to do with pixelated graphics. The NES was a toy that you played with your plastic pal who's fun to be with. And oh yeah, the NES also played a dozen other games that had nothing to do with Rob. In truth, Rob was an almost completely useless gimmick. Nintendo made a whopping two games for Rob, both of which shipped alongside the NES in 1985. No third party ever did a thing with the gadget, presumably because Rob himself was useless on his own. In order to interact with the game, Rob required a small fleet of small, pricey, and easily lost accessories. Anyone familiar with Nintendo in the years since the NES launch recognizes the general strategy behind Rob. It's a Nintendo standard. Develop an interesting peripheral to create a sense of unique value for the console, make a couple of games for that peripheral, then abandon it and its owners before they know what hit them. See also the Famicom 3D Glasses, the Super NES Light Gun, the Super NES Mouse, the 64DD, the Game Boy Advance e-card reader, the Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green wireless adapter, the play an infinite slew of Wii controller accessories, Game Boy Micro Faceplates, the Wii U GameCube controller adapter, and probably the new 3DS. Rob was where this frustrating tradition began, and by the time the NES properly took off in the US, fans had extracted every gram of entertainment to be had from Rob. The cute little robot drifted from his place by player's side to a dusty corner on the TV credenza to a jumbled pile of parts in a box, his battery slowly leaking and corroding over time to render the forgotten RoboPal into a useless heap of plastic. But Rob did the trick Nintendo needed him to do. In an era where the word video games caused American toy retailers to recoil and make signs of the cross, Rob softened their hearts and sat front and center in Nintendo commercials and print ads. The company offered Rob two ways. First, as a pack-in for the pricey but undeniably cool NES Deluxe set, where it sat alongside the console, a zapper, two controllers, packaged copies of Duck Hunt and Gyromite, and a small armada of Gyromite accessories. But Rob also came in a standalone variant for those who bought the barebones NES Basic set and decided later that they wanted to spend a lot of money to play two mediocre puzzle action games. While the zapper continued to appear as an NES pack-in well into the console's life, Rob disappeared quite a bit sooner. Considering the gadget's size, cost, and lack of ongoing support, there wasn't much value to keeping him around. The NES had won. Rob had served his purpose. Today, of course, Rob is more a nostalgic tchotchke than something people genuinely use. He's a great display piece, iconic and charming without taking up too much space, but few ever go to the trouble of setting him up to play the two games he shipped with. On top of the elaborate setup required to use Rob, there's also the small matter that, like the Zapper, he doesn't work with modern televisions. Rob is keyed to cathode ray tube technology, which means that unless you keep around an ancient tube TV for laughs, the march of technology has reduced one of its most memorable emissaries into an unseeing lump. And even in the olden days of CRT televisions, Rob was never guaranteed to work. Light interference can prevent him from seeing a screen, and even two bright television screens can cause trouble. The robot shift with an optional filter to affix to his eye lens as if needed. Even Nintendo found Rob vexing. When NES designer Masayuki Uemura spoke about the system's history last year at NYU, he laughingly admitted that Nintendo's designers didn't really understand the accessory. 
Nintendo wunderkind Howard Phillips has also spoken about the frustrations that Rob inspired during those crucial early retail demos. Nintendo personnel were given detailed instructions about how to showcase Rob, but even then those presentations involved a lot of finger crossing in the hopes that the ambient light wouldn't overwhelm his sensors and turn the demo into a farce. A tech crisis that a new generation of Nintendo presenters would become familiar with during E3 demos for Wii games. Despite all of this, Rob remains a beloved NES memory and a symbol of the NES for millions. So you can't really call the device a disaster. It brilliantly leveraged Nintendo's experience with toy making and their light gun technology to give their gaming aspirations a foothold in a hostile market. Building a future with the strength of the past, a smart move and one that Nintendo deservedly prospered from. Next time on Good Intentions. Oh, oh, oh wait, that's right. This episode was supposed to be about Gyromite. Gyromite was one of two games Nintendo ever produced for Rob, and it uses the robot's limited interactive capabilities in a completely different way from its counterpart, StackUp. It also requires a completely separate set of accessories than StackUp, because why should things be easy? In a nutshell, Gyromite was a puzzle platformer very much in keeping with the games of the early 80s. Think Mappy, Nuts and Milk, Flappy, or Dordor, and you're on the right track. As it happens, all four of those games had already made an appearance on the Famicom by the time Gyromite launched in Japan. So while Gyromite feels like a bit of an oddity to Americans who missed out on the PC arcade puzzle action conversions of the early Famicom days, to Japanese fans, the game only really stood apart from a crowded field on account of requiring an elaborate and expensive peripheral to play. Gyromite tasks players with guiding a professor through a maze to collect sticks of dynamite before they explode. Professor Hector and his Player 2 counterpart Professor Vector have no offensive capabilities of their own, and the mazes they have to navigate have become infested with odd bird-like creatures called Smicks, who are deadly to the touch. The challenge then becomes to collect all the dynamite scattered throughout each maze without stumbling into a Smick. You have only two resources at your disposal. First, you can distract the Smicks by dropping fruit in their path. Professor Hector can only use the fruit he actually finds in a maze, and he can only carry a single piece at a time and it only works as a temporary distraction once. When a smick has eaten a piece of fruit, it's gone for good. So this tactic is quite limited, but it's essential, as a feasting smick becomes immobile while it gobbles its food, remaining motionless and passive so that Hector can slip past to safety. Dropping fruit in tactical spots becomes a key to surviving Gyromite's mazes. However, that's not Hector's only survival resource. The other comes in the form of Rob. Hector has the ability to stop and send instructions to Rob, turning the game robot interaction into a part of the game itself. By pressing select, players put the game into transmit mode, which involves Hector standing still and fiddling with a remote control that relays commands to Rob. While Hector stands motionless in transmit mode though, the game itself doesn't stop. The countdown timer continues to tick down and smicks continue to maraud through the stage. You're vulnerable while in transmit mode, but you can't complete the game without using it. But what, you may ask, is the point of transmit mode? How does Rob have any impact on the game? This is where the gyro element of Gyromite comes into play. Rob's role in the game involves opening and closing pipe-like red and blue gates that divide the stages. Rob's accessory set for Gyromite consists of a pair of gyros, a spinner, and two colored levers. The levers in question correspond to the gates, and by placing a gyro on a lever, all gates of that corresponding color will descend. Lift the gyro, and the gates will rise. Transmit mode, then, allows you to feed Rob instructions. It's not as simple as raising or lowering the gates, though. The process of actually making Gyromite work involves a complex series of actions. There's a reason each stage gives you a counter of 999 to work with. Playing Gyromite correctly is a slow and arduous process. Note that I say playing Gyromite correctly because you can very easily play the game wrong and render it weightless and trivial. In fact, it's several orders of magnitude easier to play it wrong than to experience the game it was designed to be played, since the proper way involves Rob and his accessories and real NES hardware and a CRT television. For all of Rob's convolutions, in the end he amounts to a Rube Goldberg device to perform a single task, pressing the A and B buttons on controller 2. The gates in Gyro might correspond not only to levers, but to the two buttons on the second controller, which slots into a holder that faces Rob. Rob interacts with the game like a person would. 
He presses a controller 2 button to lower the gate activated by that button, and releases it in order to raise the gate. The red and blue levers on Rob's gyromite attachments are connected to separated, hinged rails. And when the robot places a gyro on one of the levers, the weight causes the rail to press and hold a button, which triggers an in-game gate. In other words, if you want to play gyromite without the hassle of setting up Rob, you can just have a second player activate the gates for you. Heck, it's a simple and slow enough game that you can do it yourself with your offhand. Professor Hector only needs to tap the A button on controller 1 to pick up and drop fruit, and besides that, the only time you'll use a controller 1 function besides the D-pad is to trigger transmit mode, which you don't need if you're not using Rob. The problem is that, if you're not using Rob, Gyro it becomes laughably simple and lacks anything even resembling challenge. Since the overwhelming majority of NES fans have experienced the game through emulation or without a proper robot setup, Gyro Mike seems like a pointless exercise. In truth though, it's actually a lot of fun. I went into this episode expecting to have no end of insulting critical remarks to make about Rob and Gyromite, but in practice I had a great time playing the game. Gyromite is cumbersome, and Rob was a big waste of plastic, no question. But for Gyromite, Rob creates a wholly unique NES experience by reversing the relationship between software and hardware. See, you don't use Rob to play Gyromite, you use Gyromite to play Rob. The challenge of the game comes not from trying to outwit the stupid, slow-paced Smix, but rather in juggling Rob's mechanisms while avoiding threats to Professor Hector. Rob can have two gyros active at once, and balancing them, literally, with the on-screen action and the slow, methodical movements of the robot becomes the true challenge of the game. Nintendo's marketing line for Rob was that he'd help you play the game, but no, Rob is clumsy and awkward, and your role is to help him instead. The gyro might set up for Rob worked like this. You'd place the robot somewhere with a clear view of the television, then attach his game-specific add-ons. Those consisted of the aforementioned controller tray with a gyro lever and rail mechanisms, a pair of shafts to the side for storing inactive gyros, and finally the gyro spinner. The spinner is a remarkable piece of work, a small motorized device that triggers when the gyro is placed in it and sets the gyro spinning. It's a powerful beast of a device powered by its own D-cell battery, and it gets the gyro spinning at incredibly high speeds. I can't imagine Nintendo or anyone making a toy like this these days. But in the 80s, it was anything goes. The whole gyro element of Gyromite is actually pretty impressive on its own. The setup is engineered remarkably well, and a fully spinning gyro can keep itself upright for about 5 minutes before losing balance. Playing Gyromite involves a lot of gyro swapping, grabbing the devices from their holders, spinning them up, placing them on the levers, and moving them to a stable location before they start to run down. It's a fascinating balancing act that requires you keep an eye on the in-game situation, the status of the gyros, and the actions of the robot itself. You can use Professor Hector's transmission device to send six different commands to Rob. Up, down, left, right, open, and close. The first two, up and down, determine the height of his arm assembly, which in this game can be positioned at three heights, high, medium, and low. Left and right cause his entire body to rotate through five different positions, while his head remains fixed to watch the television. And open and close control his claws, which can grip the central shaft of spinning gyros without affecting their momentum. Gyromite is an easy game. Gyromite played while paying heed to Rob's gyros and methodical movements, though? That's a real challenge. Besides the standard game, Gyromite offers a B-mode in which you have no direct control over Professor Hector. Instead, he sleepwalks, marching methodically left to right, and you have free control over Rob. Your task in B-mode is simply to move the red and blue gates to allow the somnambulant professor to reach the exits of each stage. There's no timer in these levels, and instead you're awarded points based on how many steps Hector takes. Hector will come to a halt when he hits a wall or gate, which affords you time to set up your gyros and plan your moves. A big part of this mode really comes down to timing. You need to master the art of lowering a gate for Hector, then immediately raising it so that it propels him upward to a higher level. Smix patrol these stages well, and Mode B's main challenge is to prevent Hector from wandering mindlessly into them. That's more easily said than done, unfortunately. You can't scroll ahead to look at the stage layout in Mode B the way you can in the main game, which means there's a heavy element of blind luck and memorization in Mode B that undermines the integrity of its design. 
It's a neat idea. It's basically Mario and Wario a decade early, or the precursor to Lemmings, and it features a musical theme remarkably similar to Balloon Fight's Balloon Trip mode. But it's too reliant on trial and error, and more's the pity. Even so, though, Gyromite really stands out as one of the most unique and inventive games of the early NES launch cycle. Yes, it arose from a marketing gimmick, and Nintendo did an execrable job of supporting Rob B on those first two games, but Gyromite itself is a fascinating feat of engineering. Would it surprise you to learn that Rob was an invention by Gumpei Yokoi, the designer who had created Nintendo's most innovative and influential gadgets and devices since the 60s? Rob embodied Yokoi's design tenet of finding creative uses for established technology, and here he converted the NES's light gun tech into an elaborate bit of gadgetry nonsense. You can really see Yokoi's signature in the combination of fascinating high-tech wizardry with the decidedly low-tech physical mechanisms that were the gyros. Rob was arguably Nintendo's last great toy creation. It served as a perfect symbolic bridge between the company's two eras, and the fact that Rob has become so iconic is only fitting. Gyromite and Rob were evolutionary creations joining the company's analog past to its digital future. And Gyromite's pretty great, too. If you ever have the chance to play it properly, be sure to do so. You just might be surprised by how much you enjoy it. Next on Good Intentions, Rob's batting average drops to 500 as his second and only other game turns out to be a total strikeout.